Hello there. A very warm welcome to this week's Talking Europe on France 24. Now, wherever you are in the world, Russia has not been far from the headlines recently. And a small town in the UK, Salisbury. That's where a former Russian spy and his daughter were discovered in early March, victims of a chemical attack. Since then, the UK has galvanised the joint backing of the entire EU to point the finger at Russia. But Russia isn't taking it lying down. There have been expulsions of more than 150 diplomats on all sides and the story is far from over. Joining me to discuss what some are calling a return to a cold war are my distinguished guests today. We're joined by a former European Affairs Minister of France, Noël Lenoir. Hello there. Hello. We're also joined by Pierre Vange Berez, who's a leading French socialist MEP, in the job now for 24 years, I think. That's true. Hello. And uh, <laughs> we're also joined uh, by General Dominique Trinquant, who's the former head of France's military mission to the United Nations, uh, among many other things. Thank you for being with us. Well, we're going to start off with an update on the story that prompted all of this. Uh, this report comes from France 24's James Franey. The world's top diplomatic forum meeting in New York to discuss the poisoning of an ex-Soviet spy in rural England last month. Far from business as usual for the UN Security Council. Britain accuses Russia of the attack on Sergei Skripal and his daughter. Russia denies this and says Britain has questions to answer about the handling of the case. Couldn't you come up with a better fake story? We've told the British you are playing with fire and you will be sorry. I won't take any lectures on morality or on our responsibilities under such international conventions from a country that, as this council debated yesterday, has done so much to block the proper investigation of the use of chemical weapons in Syria. Britain and its allies kicked out a total of 150 Russian diplomats. Russia then responded with tit-for-tat measures. These buses took 60 US envoys away from their embassy in Moscow on Thursday morning. 66-year-old Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia were found unconscious on a park bench in Salisbury on March the 4th. They'd eaten lunch at this Italian restaurant where investigators found traces of a Soviet-era nerve agent. Sergei Skripal remains in a critical but stable condition in hospital. Yulia is recovering and says her strength is growing daily. The OPCW, the International Chemical Weapons Watchdog, is already investigating the Salisbury poisoning, but it doesn't have the power to point the finger at anyone. So key questions such as why Mr Skripal and his daughter, and why now, will be left for the police to answer. Indeed, many questions are remaining. Uh, the first one that I'd like to bring up with my guests, I think, is uh, about the latest uh, from the Russian ambassador at the United Nations there. Noël Lenoir, perhaps if I come to you first as a former minister. Um, the Russian ambassador really hitting out at the UK. He even quoted Alice in Wonderland, that surreal story at some point. Um, is Russia behaving seriously? Is Russia taking this seriously? Well, I think that, you know what they say, and it seems absolutely inconceivable for us, is towards their own population. Because as you know, Putin has just been elected by 76% of the votes, which is not enormous, because we know that he was a sole candidate. The other ones were puppets, uh, the, well, appointed by him in a way. So he has to, to reaffirm his uh, authority. And of course, it's, it's, it's not for us that he says that, but he, he wants to, to, to show that he despises uh, the, the allies, as we say. So he takes it not seriously, but it's not his problem. Mm. <laughs> Père Vange Perez, if I put the same question to you, uh, do you agree with Noël Lenoir that this is uh, aimed more at the Russian people than at the international audience? Because there are very serious ramifications of all this. Well, of course, uh, when uh, President Putin is acting, you always have to find out what's his, what he has behind, behind his mind. And I, I can agree that obviously some of his speech is dedicated to his internal uh, audience, but uh, also he's playing a game uh, uh, at the EU level. And um, I don't know 
what really happened uh, in UK. Huh? Uh, but of course, uh, what uh, the UK representative here said in the, in the UN, saying that it's a bit weird to uh, uh, to have uh, uh, the, the the Russian uh, complaining about uh, chemicals that they don't never applied mm. uh, to any convention or any international uh, agreement. Mm. Uh, I think she really has a point there. Uh, the fact that it's between Russia and uh, UK that this whole story is going on uh, might also have an impact for the European scene. Huh? Uh, because, of course, uh, all EU 27 member states, uh, namely the remaining uh, EU member, uh, had to ally with no doubt uh, uh, behind UK. And uh, obviously this... Uh, is also to take into account in the whole strategy that Putin is putting uh, on on the scene. So I, I agree with uh, Noël Le Noir's uh, uh, approach regarding the internal mm. uh, audience of uh, Putin, but I would add that uh, it might also have a, a, a European dimension that should not be under-evaluated. Absolutely. Uh, we might come back, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, first, if I come to you, though, General Trincon, uh, in terms of the actual allegations themselves, Russia consistently saying, come on, where's your proof that this actually came from Russia? Uh, the UK says it has a lot of proof. 27 other member states believe that proof. Uh, this is a very serious case, isn't it? How far do we need to go, though, with this evidence uh, presentation? I think it will be very difficult to have the real proof. That's why Russia is playing on that and laughing about the, the proof. But uh, I will add on the, the European dimension, on the British dimension, because I think it's very important for the current government in UK to show that all European and the US are blocking everything around them. Even if UK is living, uh, is living Europe, mm. the European are fighting with Britain. Mm. So it's very important for the population in, in UK to think about that. But uh, I really sh think that, as usual, for the last 10 years, Russia has played another type of game. Uh, look at Crimea, look at Ukraine. All these are different and new kind of war. Mm. And this is probably a new kind of war. It will be very difficult to have the, the real proof about that. The British are probably, and the technical, the, the, uh, the professional in that term, are profi probably uh, hampered by what's happened in 2003. Mm. They need to have the proof. Mm. Uh, not to, to show that, like in 2003... With the Iraq just, War. With, with the Iraq War, mm. you said you have mass... Uh, ma mass uh, weapons of weapon, mass destruction. Weapon of mass destruction, where there were no weapon of mass destruction. So here, they are very cautious mm. about that, because in the intelligence arena, proof are very important. Well, it is uh, important, as you say, that uh, European solidarity as well. And I think uh, Theresa May had to work pretty hard at the European summit to get all the other member states on board with that joint declaration that they did believe Russia was responsible. There have perhaps been some cracks in that solidarity there. If I come back to you, Noël Lenoir, um, there are several European countries that haven't gone as far as expelling Russian diplomats. Uh, and indeed, the UK is leaving the European Union in one year's time, starting a transition period at least. Can the UK expect to have this kind of solidarity in future? Yes, I think so. Yes, of course, because we have common interests. And we perfectly well know that, unfortunately, we have to get along well with Putin. But he's provocating us and he's trying to see where we, 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 we can go and, and he can provoke us. So I think that, as was said by uh, General Trincon, in, in, the, in the domain of defence and security, we will still be very, very close to the, to the British because we are the two nations which can operatingly uh, be uh, on the ground. But there is potential for conflict between the UK and the rest of the EU once the UK has left. Perhaps if the UK doesn't get the kind of trade deals that it wants, there's certainly a lot of Euroscepticism. But it's... Pérez, no, sorry, but this is exactly, you wanted to come in. I mean, here you have to think in a triangle. You have Russia, 
EU27 and UK. Mm. This is going to be the situation tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the EU27, everybody has its own history with uh, Russia. And it's been very difficult, uh, even after the, the Berlin Wall fall, uh, to have a common vision of the EU strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Huh? That's mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. If you're a Baltic country, if you're Poland, if you're France, mm -hmm. you have another the vision of it. And it's one of the key uh, uh, elements of the definition of a, an external uh, foreign policy that we could uh, align our, our vision of uh, the relation between the EU and and, uh, and uh, Russia. But on top of this, mm. the question is, what is now for the EU27 the biggest challenge in the relation with UK? It's to establish the future relationship. And we're very and much in the process of establishing that. Exactly. Nothing is sure. And nothing is sure, even though because uh, UK obviously doesn't know what it really wants to ask for. Uh, and uh, you can see that for them to have the defense defense chapter on, on top of it, uh, whatever happened uh, in the nature of the relations through a trade agreement or something like this, uh, the question of defense will allow UK to, to claim for a special link with the EU on top of what, whatever would happen in the nature of the future contract. And I think this is also what Theresa May is trying to integrate in her own strategy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the EU27. Now it's up to the EU27 to answer and to define how they want to answer to this. Something is very interesting is that if you've got the proof of the Russian attack on the British soil, then in NATO terms, you can apply Article mm. 5, yeah, exactly. which is very dangerous. Then you are no longer on the Cold War. But Tell us more about Article 5. Article 5 mm. means that if one mm. of the NATO countries is attacked, then all the country will defend this country. Mm. So now we have uh, diplomats going out from the mm -hmm. country, just a diplomatic way of mm -hmm. fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we go at another stage, it can be very dangerous. That's why I think the proof will be very difficult to, to have and probably people don't want to really show the proof. Well, because I think then you, you, are, you are stepping up in, could, in the wall. Could there be an, an argument, though, to say... I think Russia knows that the rest of the world, all these uh, Western countries coming together, don't want war either. We had the head of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, on in mid-March saying, we don't want a new Cold War, we don't want an arms race. Uh, a dual-track approach to Russia but is the way forward. Never, I mean, it's very scarcely in a <laughs> human story that, uh, uh, in humanity story, that people want to go to war. But sometimes uh, the condition, and uh, I can see other risk of war than just the one with Russia. If you look at the situation in Korea, it's still not very... Mm. Uh, a peaceful over there. So, and the whole strategy by the Trump administration is not helping to smooth down the the international uh, relations. So, I mean, we, we we can't be naive. This is also why, uh, in the future uh, budget of the EU, how the EU is going to engage itself in building up a, a, a credible defense strategy is very important. And in this uh, chapter, the way France is going to invite or push or uh, mobilize its partner to be credible here is very important. Well, I think that also uh, there is an issue for us European, which is fake news and the interference of the Russian government in, in the electoral uh, uh, process. And I think that uh, it is also a signal that there are uh, common concerns between these countries mm -hmm. And that unfortunately, and especially France, many people in France would like to have very good relationships with Russia because traditionally and the Gaullist uh, uh, tradition uh, is, you know, the third way between the US and between Russia, but we can't. And I think that what is absolutely remarkable, even though certain countries such as Bulgaria, which is presiding Europe at the, at the present time, the government of Bulgaria is extremely close to Russia, such as Cyprus, such as Malta, because they have all the, the money of the Russians there. But though they are united in the way that they are a bit reluctant unofficially, but they consider that there is a European concern. And in that way, I think that the Russian, it's not, it has no influence at all on the Russian people because they, they admire the, the Tsar, the new Tsar. But it has a good influence in my way in my, in my view, sorry, on, on, on European cohesion. Certainly uh, something that Europe is trying to keep hold of at the moment, European cohesion, isn't it? Uh, what is very interesting is that uh, British have been uh, involved, uh, primarily involved in this attack, and we are talking about Europe. 
mm. no longer about NATO. Mm. And uh, probably the position of President Trump is of certain importance. In well, that. yes, he has expelled with the Russians, exactly. but not personally criticised Putin or, or Russia. Yeah, exactly. That's why, where it is very interesting, is that we are focusing on the fact that European are gathering around the British, defending the British position. And NATO is at a very low level, very low yeah. level, when normally, mm. facing Russia, it should be NATO, which will be at the far yeah. front. But I think that the position of President Trump concerning NATO and concerning Russia means that Europeans have more and more to do on the defence of Europe. Okay. Well, do we believe then, considering that President Trump has had a, a very complicated relationship with Europe so far, I think we can <laughs> say, compared to previous American presidents, um, can Europe still count on the United States, Pervon Chéberez? I mean, I've never thought that uh, uh, Europe should only count on, United, on, mm. the, on, on the US. Huh? Uh, and uh, I think this was uh, somehow a consensus in the French politics that uh, uh, Europe should have it, its own defense. Huh? Mm. And uh, obviously, uh, I think the Trump administration is uh, pushing this agenda even further, uh, not only because of uh, defense matter, but also when it comes to uh, uh, the engagement that were made by his predecessor in, in the uh, Paris uh, conference regarding the climate. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the way the uh, Trump administration is turning its back uh, on the sustainable development and uh, uh, ecologic transition is something that uh, Europe should not allow. So we, we, we need to count on ourselves. All right, there are certainly a lot of questions to be answered about this case and about where it might take uh, Europe, the US, all of these are long-standing allies. Thank you all very much for discussing it for us at this point in the story. Uh, thanks very much, Noël Lenoir, Thank General Dominique Trincon and Pervenche Perez. Thanks Thank all you. for your time. Thank you. Thanks you for watching as well. We're going to be back uh, just after the news update. Uh, we'll be continuing Talking Europe. I'm going to be interviewing the European Commissioner for Finance and the Economy, Pierre Moscovici. Do stay with us for that. We'll see you in a couple of minutes' time.